All right, so it's recording and I hand over to Kaspar. I'll share my screen if, if you could fix that. Um, otherwise, hello, good evening. Uh, plenty of people are here. I'm not going to talk too much about tiny forests, actually. I'm going to talk about uh, forests in general. And um, yeah, there's, of course, a lot to talk about. Um, complex systems forests are, so I'm trying to keep it brief and really boil it down to what is important. Um, I still can't share my screen. Uh, that would be helpful for me to give the presentation. Mr. Blomer. I'm I'm working on it. Wait it. Okay, sorry, no worries. <laughs> uh, I hope it's this one. Try now. Ah, uh, yeah, there we are. Good. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm I'm gonna ask some questions in between. Um, I would love some participation on that. If not, then I'm going to, going to do it on my own, no worries. If you have questions, um, speak up. I don't think I can see the chat. So um, just let me know when you have any questions. And without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, what? Ah. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about forest ecosystems, I'm going to talk about forest soils, and I'm going to talk about the link between forests and climate change. And um, the most important part, I would say, is the ecosystem part. So that's right in the beginning, uh, in case anyone falls asleep in between. Forest ecosystems. Um, the definition of an ecosystem is the biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. And as I said, forests are really complex systems. Um, so unfortunately, I cannot talk about everything. And I will, for example, skip animals um, almost completely. Um, just so you know. And I'm going to start right with a question. Here you can see two pictures, two forests. They, they look... Um, similar there's some green and some brown and i would like to you to describe what you what you can see on on these two pictures and uh, basically point out the differences between those two pictures if anyone is willing to step up well i can say there's no bushes right it's just trees on the left side yeah no bushes uh, and all the same kind of trees on the, on the left side. And it's completely different in the, in the, on the right side. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good start. Um, to, to put this in more broader terms, when we describe a forest, we can talk about the structure. We can, and, and by extent, the age and the height of, of the trees in a forest. Um, the number of species, of course, uh, among other things. And as you pointed out rightly, it's all the same on the left-hand side. It's, well, sorry. Um, it's arguably the, arguably the same species all over. It's the same diameter. It's uh, all planted in line. Um, and it is supposedly the same height too. And on the right, it's completely different. As you said, we have we have different dimensions of trees. We have shrubs. We have very big trees. We have some intermediate trees, um, and all the height is different too. Fun fact: um, you you said there's some many different species on the right too. That is actually not the case. Um, on the left hand side, we had a Pinus daeda plantation, which is just one species, and on the right, we had a on, had an old growth. Uh, beach forest uh, from Ukraine, where there's almost only beach with over 97%. Um, but yeah, as I already said, the, the one on the left, it's one height, one pioneer species, what a pioneer species is and what a climate species is, I will get to. Um, there's one age and one horizontal and vertical structure, or rather no structures, just um, one level. And on the right hand side, that was very different. And when we try to look at the structure in a more schematic term, then we can look at this. Um, uh, 
And here again, my my question to to you is: What resources do the plants compete for? When we have uh, many different plants in a in a forest, what are the resources they need? Someone else than Mr. Blume, maybe. Beautiful. Um, just like my old lectures. Well, oh, we have. Sorry. <laughs> no worry. <laughs> Please. I couldn't uh, turn it on. So I would say they need water and sun, of course. Uh, and that's very important for them to grow. It's not, it's not that hard overall. But yeah, that's right. They also need water, of course. Um, they need nutrients and they need space to and uh, to grow and if we look at this or if we look at, uh, at an ideal natural untouched uh, forest in general then we have different layers we have the root and the moss layer at the very bottom or at the very forest floor then we have the herb layer then we have the shrub layer the understory and the canopy layer um and when we have different layers then within different layers we also have different different amounts of the of the resources uh, plants need for example and the canopy layer we have of course the full sunlight because the light comes from above and then in the understory it's a little bit less and then in the shrub layer it's even less and so forth and it's the same with water so when the when the rain falls down it is partially intercepted by leaves and there it stays and maybe it evaporates right from the leaves and um, so less water and less sunlight is, is reaching the lower layers of a of a forest um, at the same time different uh, or the more layers usually result in uh, more stable forest systems and they usually have a better uh, nutrient cycling overall and uh, as such they have very fertile topsoil so since all plants also need nutrients the forest ecosystems are usually the um, way better in providing nutrients for for new plants uh, which is also of course shared or and competed for in um with a uh, in between the different plants and the between the different species and even more so since we have many different layers we have again the very different um, contribution and distribution of, of of light and or water we have in a in very structured forest ecosystem we have many different microclimates and this enables niche species to grow um, in such a forest too because Maybe if you walk just five meters, then there's just a little bit more water reaching the forest floor because maybe there's an old tree that just died down, um, um, and so more more rainfall reaches the forest floor. And I just I just touched on that with the light conditions. These change, of course, when canopy tree canopy tree species. Or canopy trees die, um, or they're harvested when when they're when it's a managed forest. But there's um, also, at least in the temperate climate zones of the earth, there's of course winter, and uh, then deciduous trees shed all their leaves. And so, for example, here in Germany, in spring we have um, a very small window, sometimes not even two weeks, in the early spring where the root and moss layer gets the total on the herb layer gets the total sunlight because the upper layers don't uh, haven't grow, regrown their leaves yet uh, and so they have a very very short window of time where they get the full sunlight and they have it's warm enough for them to blossom and so all these different layers they are important in shaping the the different conditions which uh, which a forest as a whole, offers to um, to plants and to different tree species and to different uh, shrub species. And I talked about light now a lot. 
And one way to distinguish diff different plant species in general, but um, we're going to stick to the tree species, is by their demands for light. And that brings me to the next slide. We have the pioneer species. And if you can recall the uh, Pinus theida, uh, from the from the very first picture on the left, that is a pioneer species, and beech, for example, is a climax species. And those two groups of of tree species, is there a question? Oh, no. Sorry, um, and those two uh, groups are, are the polar opposites. Pioneer species are shade intolerant; they need a lot of sun light um, and they're able to to grow in, in in a lot of sunlight they're usually very fast growing and they have low nutrient and water requirement they have light seeds uh, they're wind pollinated and examples are pines in general penis diada one one of them and birch for example and now my question again or well, one question again um why do pioneer species have light seeds and why are they wind pollinated Okay. The reason is, uh, it's because they're shade intolerant, or I mean, I don't know what came first, actually, but they're shade intolerant, they can't grow under a canopy of other trees. So they can't really grow underneath themselves, but they rather have to find new open areas, uh, forests yet, and which Are where there are no um, trees growing yet, and to reach those areas and to reach away, then um, then a, then an animal could carry it. They need light seeds, which are blown away by the wind very far, and so in order to grow on new sites, and that's oh, they have to grow far. Uh, they have to fly far to grow. This is why they're called pioneer species. And as I mentioned, the soils in forests are usually more nutrient nutrient rich and that and since the pioneer species don't grow in forest soils that uh, translates to their low nutrient and water requirements because there simply isn't as much and if you think about germany for example you have old train tracks sometimes when you take the train you can see that on old disused train tracks which there's no soil on really it's just gravel and old stones um which are very exposed in the full bright sun the one tree species which you will always see there is birch and that is because it's a pioneer species and it's able to grow in these conditions um one last question i hope somebody is uh, can answer that and that's the question is why are they fast growing what is it because they don't have a very long lifespan yes oh also they they tend to not have a very long lifespan i i don't actually know if that's the reason i'm i was or my understanding was is that they're simply not as competitive as, as climax species so in order to to get as much sunlight as they need because they're shade intolerant they always need to stay on top and in order to stay on top they have to grow faster than uh, the surrounding tree species and as i said climate species hold opposite they're shade tolerant so they can stay for example under a canopy of pioneer species for a longer time they're slow growing um partially because the the light conditions aren't as favorable for for fast growth. They have higher site requirements, which also require the pioneer species to alleviate or ameliorate the soil at least a little bit. They tend to have heavier seeds and are being insect pollinated. And one example you saw is the beech, and another one is the oak. And what I now touched on the the process of a pioneer species to to fly its seeds somewhere else, where isn't there where there's no forest yet, 
and then growing there and then eventually there's more shade and more climbing species um can can grow on such such side that is overall <laughs> simply the process of succession and which uh, is basically what you can see here in the beginning we have bare rock and we have nothing uh, very exposed sites um, the rain is falling straight down um, we may have soil erosion if, if the uh, rainfall is heavy or if the wind blows really hard so harsh conditions overall and then with time we have mosses and grasses flying in or growing in very slowly and they grow they die and then they leave some nutrients in their in their organic matter behind and so pushing the the, the nutrient the nutrients in the on the side just a little bit and eventually um the the nutrients become enough that for example grasses and perennials can now start growing on the side because the side conditions aren't as harsh anymore they the roots of the mosses they stabilize the soil a little bit we have just a little bit less soil erosion um and so yeah then grasses and perennials eventually start growing there and then the cycle continues so or starts again these perennials they come to a site they grow they eventually die they leave behind the organic matter um this organic matter is accumulated in the soil and eventually we have enough nutrients for we pioneers to to start growing on the site and so far so forth until we have the fast growing species uh, fast growing trees which are the pioneer species and eventually the climate climate species this process takes a long time of course um in fact it can take up to 200 years if we just leave nature nature as it is you can see here in this in this figure on the on the left hand side what i just said we have this uh this bare land this may come because of human impact but might also have been um, just a major fire or, or something just a major disturbance in general and then we have the cycle of of grasses herbs perennial herbs shrubs uh, and pioneer species and eventually climax species which uh, form the climax forest for now we're gonna ignore the the, the overall right hand side of this figure but what is important here, I circled it in red, that is the PNV. That is the next important thing for us to know when eventually somewhere down the future we're going to plant a tiny forest. The PNV is the potential natural vegetation. Um, many different or a few different uh, definitions you can see here. Uh, what it does basically is it tries to describe the the plant community that is best suited to the to the site conditions so the, the, the weather the climate um the topography and everything which would grow there if the human would have never interfered with that site um so since at least in Euro europe we in the this this human influence is not is or is given in almost any case so the potential potential natural vegetation um is sometimes a little bit difficult to figure out and sometimes a little bit difficult to map um yeah as i just said it's the plant society growing there without human influence um and the without part being the important part uh, and being the point of contention, actually. It has been mapped since the 1960s. Uh, Reinhard Tixen was, was one of the first, if not the first, to, to come up with the context. Um, and of course, the, the potential natural vegetation, it changes with um, 
with the epochs it changes with the climate so in uh, during the ice ages it was colder so different pnv was was maybe growing where there's now um overall beach forest or before the beach invaded um germany from the uh, after the ice age uh, there was another pnv and if you map the pnv uh, for example, here in Southeast Bavaria, then this is what it looks like. Um, just to show you, we have a lot of, we have many different potential natural natural vegetations um, in the Southeast of Bavaria, in, in Germany in total. Um, so it's a rather complex, complex um, way to, to figure out the PNV of, of, any, of any one site. This is the legend the which uh, comes with this with this map from Bavaria. And as you can see, many different plant societies, many different titles for those plant societies. Um, but it's important to to understand this topic and to to find this potential natural veg vegetation for your site or any site where you want to grow trees or a forest rather. Um, because as I said, there's is the plant society that is best adapted to, to one particular site, to all the abiotic factors of the site, which is overall best suited and therefore has the, the best promises to develop well. Uh, on any given site. So to recap, forests and forest ecosystems have different horizontal and vertical structures. They're divided into different layers. The tree species uh, growing in, in forests can be divided into pioneer species and climbing species. And there are opposites in, in all the requirements. The succession describes the sequence of different plant communities on a site and coming from bare soil to a climate climax forest naturally can take up to 200 years. And the potential potential natural vegetation, difficult word, is the plant society that is best adapted to a site if it were not uh, for the interference of humans. These are the, the things I want you to take home um, about forest ecosystems tonight, because this understanding will eventually aid you in, in planting and planning a tiny forest. Coming to forest soils next. Um, what is soil? Soil is actually, or the fancy word, petosphere is the intersection of the lithosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere. Biosphere being all things living or formerly living. Hydrosphere, of course, being water. Atmosphere is the atmosphere. And lithosphere being the rock on which the soil develops. And how does it develop? soil so that is through weathering either physical or chemical weathering the physical weathering is also called mechanical weathering and for example with frost weathering we have tiny cracks in the rock water seeps in it freezes the ice expands um, the rock breaks then the um, ice melts again water evaporates and so on and so forth the same is with thermal stress, where when the temperatures change, the rock expands and sometimes the stress is too much. With chemical weathering, uh, their water is a principal agent and water in the form of rainfall either simply washes out some minerals and some chemical compounds, or um, if it's a, if it's acidic, by dissolving by oh, that is important in limestone, for example, then it um, acts as a dissolution of the soil. And the decomposition 
And that is not the that is done by earthworms, bugs, lava, and microorganisms that decompose the organic matter which uh, accumulates on the on the soil floor. And that's the reason why biodiversity below ground is actually just as important as the biodiversity above ground. It's maybe even more important, even though we don't see it. And usually, or often when we talk about biodiversity, and then we only think about different trees and different birds, but not about different worms, for example. Anyway, the key takeaway uh, here is not the different kinds of, of physical weathering, but that these weathering processes and the decomposition processes take a very long time. Then they may take up hundreds of thousands of years. And so in a way, soil is more like a fossil fuel in that it takes a long, long time to evolve and develop and uh, less like a renewable energy like the sun, which is always just there. Um, and that's the reason why it protection of the soil is incredibly important. And although we can alleviate um, bad soils and we can restore them to, to form a nutrient richness, that takes time and effort, of course, and protection of the soil is really, really important. Um, what is the soil? That is, you can divide any soil into four different horizons. On the very top, you have the mulch layer, which is the organic material, dead leaves, um, branches, all of that. It holds water, it protects against evaporation, and um, it forms hummus, which is nutrient-rich and very important for plant growth. Below that, in a depth from or up up to 40 centimeters we have the topsoil which ideally has a high hummus content hummus content uh, has microbial activity so it's not that it has mycorrhizal fungi what that is i will get to and it has nutrients available again those nutrients being available for plants to uh, to grow actually below that we have the subsoil which again ideally is aerated has some nutrients and is easy to root through very important and has a good water holding capacity so when it rains that it's the the soil doesn't clog and uh, the water accumulates in in such a way that it drowns out the trees or the roots um but also doesn't uh, seed through just as is. And below that, uh, we have the bedrock. Um, that is just, yeah, the rock of, of, of planet Earth itself below there. And um, here you can see two soils. On the left, you have the soil type gumbo. And as you can see, you have very distinguishable horizons. The mulch layer on top, then you have the black. Um, the black uh, brownish a layer then you have the b layer and i think you can even see the the bedrock down there and on the right hand side you have a rincina and what is important here to note is that the b horizon for example is completely missing so it, it is not a given that we have all horizons and what horizons we have and what the characteristics of, of these horizons are, that is um, the, what eventually makes up the soil types. And some soil types are very favorable for growth, some are very favorable for, for agriculture too, and some are not so favorable. And now I talked about soil types, but easier to understand for us and maybe even more important for us are the soil characteristics and these we can distinguish into soil texture the soil organic material the different organisms living in the soil as mentioned fungi uh, or bacteria or nematodes and other small animals with the nutrient content and the water retention capacity 
first the sand texture. Here again, we have uh, like a dichotomy, just as we had with the pioneer species and the climax species. We have sand on the one side, which has or is very large particles. And as such, it has, it has good aeration and also very good drainage. Um, downside of having good drainage is that it's also very prone to drought because it simply can't hold um, the water. And it's also very loose type of, of uh, soil texture. So it's also very, very prone to erosion. On the other side, or the opposite of that, is clay. It's the smallest particles. There, it has much higher wa water retention, um, but it's lacking aeration. And in opposition to sand, there it is prone to water clogging. Uh, and, and so it's the 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 clay is so compacted that the water can't uh, can't drain away. But it can also hold the most nutrients. Um, that is because the, the clay particles have a slight negative charge, while most nutrients have a positive charge. And since opposites, opposites, opposite charges attract each other, um, clay uh, can, can hold the most nutrients. So we want clay in theory, but too much can lead to very wet sites. Um, and a particle in between which is not as big as, as sand and not as small as clay is silt. And as you as you can imagine, it's a, it has somewhat of a balanced water retention capability and it has a medium drainage. So something in between overall. But of course, we don't always only have sand or clay or silt. So if we mix these three particles in in any percentage now we get this triangle again just so you saw it once nothing nothing you have to memorize um but good to know next we have the soil organic matter that is the formerly living parts of the of the soil um this is made up of mainly three comp components. It's plant residues and living microbial biomass. It's the active soil organic matter, and it's the stable soil organic matter, which is often called humus, and which is uh, something that we desire in, in, in our soils. And when we talked about the soil organic matter, it has physical benefits, for example, it improves the water infiltration and aeration, and it reduces runoff, uh, for example, after heavy rainfalls. Um, and it improves the water retention capacity, which we want on, on, on very dry side or where we don't have as much rainfall. Um, the chemical benefits is that it stabilizes the soil pH and it accelerates decomposition of soil minerals over time, uh, making the nutrients coming from the lithosphere, so the, the bedrock, eventually available for, for plant uptake. And lastly, the biological benefits uh, is that it provides food, of course, for organisms, and it may also suppress diseases and pests in forest forests. Next, um, we have mycorrhiza or soil organisms in, in general, but I'm not going to talk about nematodes or worms, but I'm um, focusing on mycorrhiza, which is a, it's not just one fung uh, fungus, but it's many different fungi. Um, how many, I don't actually know, but, but how it works is that the fungus or the different fungi that grow into the roots of the trees uh, and since the trees produce carbohydrates via photosynthesis they share those carbohydrates with the with the fungi and in exchange the fungi um, gives water and minerals back to the tree uh, 
And these this network of, of fungi also enables trees to share nutrients with each, with each other um and in in that way supporting the growth of uh, the next successional stage and um the 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 layers below themselves um and in this way they can actually communicate with each other and for example warn other trees in the general vicinity of pests for example um and one more interesting thing about mycorrhiza is that they may also protect trees from toxic levels of metals so having mycorrhiza in your forest soil is a very favorable thing um unfortunately when we don't have forests we don't have mycorrhiza so re-establishing or reintroducing um these these fungi associations um can be can be difficult but uh, as i said favorable to achieve in, in order to achieve good growth and good development of forests in general and of uh, tiny forest too of course so nutrients i talked about nutrients a lot or rather mentioned them a lot already and you can distinguish here between the major elements nitrogen you probably heard phosphorus potassium calcium magnesium and sulfur and the trace elements iron manganese copper zinc boron and molybdenum i'm not going to delve any more into into those just so you heard what kind of nutrients we have um so to recap Soil is the intersection of the hydro, atmo, bio, and lithosphere, and it develops via physical and chemical weathering and decomposition. And especially the physical and chemical weathering can take hundreds of thousands of years. Very slow process, even slower than uh, than plant succession. So it is important to protect soil because it just simply develops um, overnight. Soils consist of different horizons, the mulch layer LO, the A, the B, and the C horizon, and different soil types can be distinguished by the specific characteristics of these different layers or horizons. And soil characteristics, which are a little bit easier to assess for, for the layman, are texture, organic matter, um, organisms living there already, among other things. Lastly, I'm pretty fast, but then we have a lot of uh, time for questions. Um, lastly, forests and their impact on climate change. And I think there, I have two figures. This is the first of them, which conveys the importance of them pretty, pretty good. Of course, when trees grow, they need carbon, suck it out of the air in, in, in the way of photosynthesis and store it in their living biomass. And the more trees we have, the more living biomass we have. Um, so the more carbon is being stored. And forests overall globally are the second biggest storehouses for, for carbon after oceans. So overall, really, really important for that. Furthermore, they improve the, the the weather or the the local climate uh they filter particles out of the air and and um like sulfur oxide or something like that so they provide clean air they act as a sponge so after re heavy rainfalls they hold back the water um which buffers against uh, natural disasters like floods when they're very uh, species rich, so very high biodiversity, they're also um, are good against wildfires because we have some species which are naturally more, more resilient towards fires and which blossom or rejuvenate much faster after wildfires. And of course, um, I think overall one third of the 
global population is still directly relying um, on forests in their in their daily livelihoods, um, mostly for for energy source, but also for, of course, non timber forest products like um, animals hunting or um, any other eatable foods. And on the other side, we have agriculture, um, which in and of itself doesn't uh, or contributes to the loss of forests because we, or not we, but uh, forests are being converted into arable lands. First to grow soy, uh, mostly unfortunately, and uh, then becoming pastures and then becoming completely degraded sites where there's uh, nothing growing on anymore. Or if it's not agriculture, then the growth of uh, population centers also contributes to the to the loss of forests and to the conversion of land away from forested areas. Um, and since the trees that once grew there sequestered all that carbon, of course, that carbon is uh, re-emitted into the atmosphere when once um, they're cut down and in case of the Amazon, often burned uh, right on the spot. And since we have all these different ecosystem services that forests provide, uh, those ecosystem services, of course, are lost when we lose the forests on natural disasters often. Um, are more, uh, more frequent in cases where there's no more forest. And last but but one no it's not that's true so here overall you can see the development of of different land uses over time we had forest and we had we had just open areas grasslands pastures in the beginning eventually agriculture came to be and because we are ever growing uh, population of humans, we need more and more agriculture, um, and of course, we need more and more space to to house all these different, all these different humans. Coming to the end already, I'm really fast. I talked about a lot about forests now, and here we are talking about reforestation, and. Reforestation is simply the process of replanting an area with trees. Um, and if we jump right back to the beginning there, the plantation, Pinus data is also a tree. So planting plantations is reforestation too. And now my question to you, why are we planting natural forests and not plantations? Um, maybe because like natural forests can also keep growing on themselves and don't rely on human interference. Yeah. I also think natural forests can um, um, interfere with another like better and with the um, like you showed with the um, communication between the different forests and different um, nutrients and I think that's a little bit easier if they are natural and we don't have to always focus on them. Anyone else? Maybe Any other ideas? Um, um, I'll go. Uh, natural forests think much more um, wildlife growth in general. I feel like the introduction of um, a natural forest allows for more proper like wildlife to actually settle in without, you know, humans having to enter the forest all the time to keep it running. I feel like that would make it so that it's much more self-sustainable and it can grow on its own. I think that was already said, mind you, but yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, they have 
plantations uh, they they have their right to be um and that right is that they're simply easier to manage and thus they have the return on on timber and the connected investments into into this timber is often faster than in natural forests this is why we plant plantations on the downside they usually have store less carbon than natural forests this is because we have less layers or usually only one layer in a plantation and not many different layers in which uh, which is filled with biomass and um, which in turn stores carbon we have often less ecosystem services than natural forests for example when we have heavy rainfall and only one layer still a lot of rain reaches the forest floor we still have uh, compar comparatively more soil erosion than uh, than in natural forests with where there are small layers breaking the rain for example we have of course less biodiversity because in plantations we have only one species and that being a defining uh, aspect of, of plantations they're more susceptible to pests and fires and droughts. Um, pests, of course, if you only have pine and you have a pine-eating beetle, then the whole plantation is gone and the whole forest stand is gone. And if you have many different tree species um, in a natural forest, then the bug may find the pines scattered in this uh, in this forest, but it won't touch all the other tree species. So overall, we still have many, many different trees understand and arguably they have um, less of an eco psychological value than natural forests again if if we jump back to the start we had this picture on the left which looked kind of boring and looked very very anthropogenic which is with its um, lines of of trees planted always in the same uh in the same way and on the right we had a much a much greener view overall and a, and a much more natural view of um of a forest so plantations not not the best way to plant trees natural forests are better in 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 almost uh any way and now another question and the ultimate question <laughs> why are we planting Miyawaki forests specifically and not natural forests in general and I know that I haven't talked about Miyawaki forests yet but um, if you think about it for a minute I may have given you the answer already um, why we're sticking to this particular method of uh, planting trees any ideas I think Miyawaki forests are easier because um the forest um is filled with indigenous um ways like um the um the um like um arten the um species yes the species are indigenous and like also now are settled there and they are just easier to uh, put up with the others mm -hmm. any other ideas oh i'm not sure but i think they uh, grow rapidly and um, i think that's good for good ecosystem anyone else i guess it's because it's it's a natural forest right it's not mm -hmm. a station <laughs> yeah um the reason why we're using this sp uh, particular method is the succession rates as i mentioned when we go from bare soil to a climax forest then the natural process being nothing growing there and then eventually mosses and grasses and eventually some shrubs and then some some taller shrubs and eventually pioneer species and only then after 
100, 200 years, we eventually have climax species um, on on a site. And 200 years, very long time. And first of all, it's much more satisfying to see um, to see the forest that you planted way back. And with 200 years, no one of us would see that. And of course, we have uh, the time pressures is at hand with with climate change and everything. And the Miyawaki forest or the the Miyawaki method tries to skip the sole succession, uh, the sole long su succession and jump straight into the climax forest. And so the idea is that we have at, at uh, uh, year zero, we have bare soil um, on which we plant uh, local climax species very densely. And after three years, they already exhibit pretty rapid growth, uh, as was mentioned. Um, and these multi, these very structured, multi layered, um, high biodiverse uh, climax forests, we try to achieve them after 20, 20 plus years and not. Um, as natural and naturally would be the case after 200 plus years. Um, this is the idea, the general idea behind uh, the Miyawaki method. And this is the reason why I talked about uh, ecological succession. Um, and this is since we plant local species, local climax species. This is the reason why I also talked about pioneer species and, and climax species and why I talked about the potential natural vegetation, which describes the, the local species of any given site. How you're gonna plan such a, such a tiny forest, uh, how you're gonna carry it out, what you need, how you identify the PNB and everything. This is the topic of, I think, next um, the next presentation. I'm gonna leave you with a couple of questions um, and for me personally the most important one is how you would define a forest there are, uh, and I give you a hint already there's more than one definition on a fo of a forest um, for you also very important what is the potential natural vegetation of Malta or more precisely of, of Gozo or I don't know if you already found the site where you're going to plant it but the, the PNB of the site you want to or you want to plant. Since we talked about climate change, which part of of a forest ecosystem stores the most carbon to, and yeah, maybe maybe some critique on on climax forests because I I mentioned that potential natural vegetation is is uh, can be a point of contention between specialists. So. Um, yeah, feel free to dig to dig into that. And with that, I'm gonna leave you with some recommendations. And the video workshops of a forest, for example, on tiny forests are very valuable. Um, I mentioned how trees talk to each other uh, via mycorrhiza. Um, yeah, and with that, I, I open the floor to discussion questions um, in in case anything wasn't clear. Yes, could you please go back to the um, homework page? Because there were different questions. Didn't we get all? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. So the critic on climax for okay. I didn't get it. Thanks. I can understand you very hard. Okay, is it better now? Yes, 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 much better. Okay. Yes, I didn't get the last point. Critic on climax forest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, um, we rely on that, of course, but um, I, I want to want to invite you to, to question why we're using that. And um, yeah, I mean, I can, I can answer that now. No, no. If, 
Uh, no. we, uh, it's homework, so we will uh, check it at home <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and come uh, with the answer next time. But uh, yeah. can we ask questions now? Of, of course, yeah. Yeah, because I would have one if you show the Miyawaki. Um, yes, this um, uh, page. Um, so you're planting a tiny forest and mm -hmm. there are uh, climax spe species, as you said. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you do if there are pioneer species invading? Because you said, uh, like the the birch, yeah, that is uh, mm -hmm. uh, pulling a lot and is uh, blown blown by the wind. Mm -hmm. And if they, um, you have a lot of uh, birch um, uh, starting trees uh, to, to grow up, do you pick them out or do you just let them grow? Um, you let them grow. This is. Um two reasons or a couple of reasons um the, the first reason I, I at at least for me we try to imitate natural processes and as such whatever happens in in our tiny forest we we just let it happen unless there's too too many weeds invading the species but with the birch let it grow there the as i mentioned the the climax species there can grow in shade so if the birch invades this area and overgrows the climax species it's not going to kill them um and for some time it's going to grow faster and for some time it's gonna um it's gonna build the the canopy layer of your tiny forests but since uh the the climax species are shade tolerant they're just going to grow they're going to grow slower than they would be with uh, than they would without the the birch on top but eventually the the birds gonna die or the 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 climax species will simply overgrow them and then in turn kill the birch because now the climax species make up the canopy layer shading out the birch and actually if you plant all your climax species already um, and then the birch comes then you imitate the the natural succession even more because there you too have first Pioneer species, for example, the birch growing on a site, and then eventually the the climax uh, species invading um, in in that way. But since we want to achieve a climax forest, we start with the climax forest uh, directly. But if the birch comes, it's no problem. I see. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, and for homework submission, do we do that? How? Um, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not your teacher. I was ah, fair enough. To to give that, I I I guess um, next next uh, Friday that would be my my colleague Stefan. I guess we can we can start uh, with a brief discussion of of these questions there. Okay. Um, then simply, I, I think uh, I don't want to see anything written down i just want to first of all get you to think get you to be involved a little bit more with the whole topic of, of forests in general and, and tiny forests and so if we have a discussion about it um then it's good enough i'm pretty sure that uh stefan is going to talk about the pnv of malta anyway um so uh yeah no pressure, at least not from my side. I actually don't know if, if this uh, whole thing is graded or not, um, but yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, that's that's already the plan, that um, if you get homework from our experts, uh, you can do it uh, in your classes, in your groups. And uh, of course, at the beginning of the next um, session, we can answer um, not only these homeworks if you want but also questions you have uh, gone far about uh, about this so um are there if there are any other questions um to Kaspar? if not um thank you very much Kaspar. this was great i think it's a it's a great basis uh, to have uh, to understand the next two or three lessons we have the next two th uh, lessons 
will be held by Stefan as um, Kasper mentioned already. Uh, these two lessons will be about um, the tiny forests uh, in special. So uh, we learn from them how they do this in Germany and in Poland, I guess. You have uh, already set up tiny forests. So we learn how actually are you doing this? How are you setting up a tiny forest which is surviving? This is <laughs> the most important part, I guess. And um, in the fourth um, lesson, uh, we get an uh, expert, we hear an expert from Malta. It's going to be Professor Luis Casar from the Malta University. And he is adapting the stuff we learned before to the Gozo setting. So he is a, a professor of geography and biological um, matters, and he will tell us a lot more about the situation on Gozo. I hope we will have then already the location we will um, set up this tiny forest. I guess it's still in the making. Professor Luis Casar is uh, talking to the ministries and stuff like that, the government, to find the perfect spot for us to set up this tiny forest. And uh, he will talk about uh, the special situation on Gozo. I don't know if any one of you uh, knows Gozo. It's uh, it's not being famous for having forests, but um, that's why we chose Gozo, because uh, it shouldn't be too easy to set up uh, this tiny forest. And um, to give an example, as you probably have heard um, uh, from your teachers, to give an example, um, to do something against the climate change and to do it even there where it, it seems to be impossible. I guess, Anthony, you wanted to say anything or? Yes, I wanted to say that uh, today we had a meeting and hopefully by next week or the following, we should conclude um, the site location. All right, thanks. Anthony, by the way, is from the Ministry of Gozo, or for Gozo, I, I think it's, it's, it's named. Um, me, I'm uh, Christian Blome. I'm one of the initiators of uh, planting uh, our future. And Rasmus, who can't be there tonight, um, he is, I don't know, is something to do something diff different. He can't be there. He is the third one. We three, uh, we are set, set up uh, this uh, project. And we are very happy to have you all with us and that you have, um, that you're interested in setting up such a tiny forest. I can guarantee you that it's going to be fun um, to do it all together. The German students who will come in October to Gozo and uh, together with the with the Gozo students, students. And we are thinking of, or we try to um, to apply for another um, Erasmus Plus um, project. Maybe we can then send the Gozo students to Germany and we can do a second part of this, maybe looking at some tiny forest set up by Mia Forests, or maybe even planting another one. Who knows? But um, we can use the time. We have already we have 20 minutes left. If you have any questions to the project itself or to the to the stuff Casper uh, just um, told you, please feel free to ask now if you have any questions. Can, it can be dumb questions. Just ask. Yes, I have a dumb question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, students from two schools now in, inside this uh, uh, communication. Is uh, there any idea that the students interact with each other during this time until October? That's a good question. And I haven't thought about that. Maybe we should set up something. Um, do you have any suggestions how we sh should do it? May I mean, we have an Instagram channel. Uh, we can maybe set up a WhatsApp group or something like that. Um, I don't know. What can probably, we probably we can do this somewhere close to uh, before the German students are coming to go to like a month before or once school starts. Um, so beginning of October. Okay, but if they want to talk to each other before, maybe in this time in the lecture period. 
Um, we can ask that, no problem. Okay, so um, I think about that. Um, maybe if you have any good ideas uh, how we can do that, maybe by setting up a WhatsApp group or um, something like that, we can can do that, no problem. I have uh, one suggestion was uh, both of our schools, they have uh, internet uh, websites. Mm -hmm. So um, the students from every school might uh, check the website from the other side and ask questions uh, what kind of school it is uh, what's the uh, um, the offering and so mm -hmm. the type of type of lessons or the amount of teachers whatever they they guess yeah why not yeah good idea good idea since uh, as you maybe already know uh, erasmus plus is a EU uh, funding, and the main aim of it is, of course, intercultural um, communication. So uh, intercultural exchange between EU students from these both countries. So if you want to talk to each other, of course, feel free to do that. Uh, we help you with the connection in some way, maybe, as I said, setting up some kind of group. I will work on this and uh, send it to your teachers and then we set something up um any questions to the planting to the time in october or to the lessons uh, yes i got a question uh, about the time in october when we go to gozo um, is it already known where we are gonna stay uh we are thinking at, uh, about this uh um, we have, I guess, we have two options, right, Anthony? We have, uh, I guess, one. Um, we, we are still deciding exactly where to host, but it could either be in uh, in some sort of a bed and breakfast or hotel, or else maybe we rent uh, some apartments and they will be self catering. Um, we're still to decide that. But we will decide very soon. But what what it's good to know, uh, we all this all we we are setting up, so you don't have to to worry about anything, not about food or something like that. Uh, we we will make this up. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Is anybody of the German students uh, been to Malta or Gozo? Anyone? No. Okay. As they say, and it's true, if you once been there, you want to be there again. It's a nice, nice island. You will like it. All right. Um, I have some uh, organizational or one organizational uh, point to clarify. Not now, but I want to just say it now. Um, we have six lessons. Today we had the first lesson and then in a weekly turn on each Friday, the same time, 17.30, the next lessons. Um, the fifth lessons lesson should be on the 22nd of March. Unfortunately, I can, because half of this is made by me, it's, it's uh, about marketing and uh, social media, um, I don't have time at this specific day. I know it's bad, but I don't have time. So my question is if we can do it the day before or on Wednesday or on Tuesday. You can think about that. I will send uh, send a, an email to your teachers uh, in case of that. And the last uh, lesson is set not on the Friday because Friday is a holiday, I guess. And uh, we may, will then make it on the Tuesday before, on the 26th of March. But still, all of these uh, lessons will be recorded and you can see it on the YouTube channel. The address I will send to the teachers and they send it to you. And so you can watch these uh, lessons every time you want and as, as much as you want. Still, of course, if you have questions even after this period of lessons, don't hesitate to ask your teachers. They will ask me. I will answer that, of course. All right. When um, will when will the Maltese go to Germany? 
<laughs> well, first we have to apply for Erasmus Plus funding. And um, I guess we will do that in probably in autumn. Some there's, there's another call in May. Probably we will apply on in in May. Uh, but just to, to just to reply to the Godzettin students, um, we are trying to include um, maybe another related project um, for you to attend to. Um, I'm in contact with Abigail and um, any information that that may develop, we will forward it straight to you. OK. Any other questions? All right. So thank you. Very much again, Kasper, for this beautiful presentation. I think it was very much insights, and we need to know all this, to have it in the background, to understand, and to build up um, for the next three uh, lectures we have, and especially, of course, for the last lecture, because the last lecture is about preparation, going right into the, the uh, planting itself, how we can set up this in October. All right, so if we clear our apps, we can wrap it up, right? So thank you very much for being with us. And uh, we see us next week in, on Friday. At well, the one note. Yeah. One note. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, was a delight and I just sent you the presentation as a PDF via mail so uh, feel free to share it um, with the students or link it uh, in the YouTube uh, yeah. description great thank you very much very helpful thanks okay so then have a good night and uh, dream of tiny forests I would say <laughs>